Before we start the podcast, I just wanted to say a quick thank you to our sponsor, Money Farm. Now, Money Farm are the leading online wealth manager in Europe, also known as a robo advisor. Now, Money Farm have managed to combine extremely low charges while outperforming their peers. Now, you could read a full review of Money Farm on moneytothemasses.com. Just search for Money Farm Review. But not only that, podcast listeners can take advantage of a special offer where Money Farm will manage the first £20,000 of their investment for free for a year if they enter the code MTTM20K when they sign up at moneyfarm.com. Hello and welcome to episode 155 of the Money to the Masses podcast with your resident expert as always, Damien Fay and me, Andy Leakes. Damien, how the devil are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm good, Andy. Very good. Um, nothing, anything of note this week to tell people, but I, I, I'm, I've been looking forward to do the podcast this week because I was excited by the fact we, we finally broke the 100 review mark, didn't we, this week? Yay! On iTunes, so we almost it deserves a fanfare but we were saying to people we wanted to break through that barrier and i think it was there were two reviews that came simultaneously there was a bunch of them that came but two that took us over the hundred mark was nano star and max white even i think max white even referenced the fact that he wanted to be the man that went over the into three figures so yeah thank you to those people but we don't want to stop there because obviously we've got a hundred reviews now which looks good on itunes but theoretically there were three or four crazy people who didn't give us five stars. So the next easy milestone for us is to get 100 five-star reviews, and that's great to be able to shout about. So if you haven't left a review already for this podcast, then do so ASAP to get us to the 100 uh, five-star reviews, and then we can kick on to the next milestone when we go and take over the world. So yes, thank you for that, but leave a review. Good. Well, it's nice to get in there nice and early, badgering people before we even start giving them content. We normally do it at the end as a as a sort of uh, oh and finally, but no, we're straight in there this week. To be honest, um, it's, we don't ask a lot. They are free podcasts, and we do try and keep it as uh, tight as we possibly can in terms of sponsorship and marketing. We don't want to absolutely you know hammer i know what it's like when you get these podcasts that are absolutely full of it you know every few seconds it seems to be an advert and we we want to try and keep it as clean as possible don't we and and reviews and sharing helps us do yeah and we do listen to them because there was a chap we mentioned the other week who gave us a a a three-star review didn't he andy and then he's now since gone back and updated it to a four star because we took on some of his feedback so we do read them there you go. Anyway, so how are you, Andy, before I launch onto this week's podcast? I'm very well. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit rested, although saying that I had a terrible night's sleep last night. Um, I'm sure the listeners don't want to hear about this, but I had a little one that was throwing up all night long. So uh, I ended up sleeping on the sofa and uh, trying my best to recover. But other than that, I'm well rested and, you know, enjoying life. So I can't, I can't really tell you much that's gone on in the last week. It's just flown by in a whirlwind. I mean, I know what you mean with childcare, because as ever on the podcast, I'm actually the sole parent in the house with my children tonight. So if you ever hear a cry from a baby monitor in the distance, you'll understand why I'll uh, probably disappear. Um, So what have we got on this week's podcast? Shall I tell you? Yes, please. I'm absolutely raring to go and uh, desperate to know what's coming up. Right. This week, we have got a couple of pieces that relate to the future. We don't try and date the podcast you know i i really want to create evergreen content but funnily enough i had a couple of questions via twitter i'm always saying to people to tweet me uh, money to the masses with the number two is the uh, twitter handle if you want to get hold of me and i had a couple of questions come via that and um, i had some via email relating to the budget because next week on wednesday next week is the budget so in the House of Parliament, Hammond is going to stand up and tell us of any changes. And of course, it's important for most people for various reasons, tax, etc. So people have asked me what I think is going to be in it. And I have not got a crystal ball. So what I'm going to do is talk through some of the things that they they are thinking that might might happen. So um, it slightly dates this section of the podcast. If you listen to this in the future, skip, skip the first third of the podcast. So you have my permission. Um, the next piece is I want to do something to do with diversifying portfolio so i'm going to bring back investment this week we didn't do investment last week i want to do a quick bit on diversifying portfolios which is quite interesting and finally the last piece is the is in relation to another event that's happening next week which is black friday now i loathe black friday cyber mondays and all those things people who listen to this podcast know i'm not one of those people who goes in for uh money saving stuff i'm not martin lewis so i don't do that kind of thing but 
I'm going to have my own version of it. I'm going to just talk about things to be aware of when you are getting carried away with um, Black Friday and all those bargains. If you don't know what Black Friday is, it's that thing came, that came from America where they apparently have ridiculous deals. It's where you, it's, it's what when you look on the news on Friday, it's, it's the thing when you see people fighting in um, <laughs> yeah. in in your local over TVs, over TVs <laughs> in your local ASDA. It came from America. It's one of those another. And slightly irritating imports that we've got from America. So I'm going to cover a bit on that. So should we kick off with the budget stuff? Yeah, let's get the budget stuff done and out the way for future listeners. <laughs> right, what I'm going to do is just rattle through as quickly as I can, in effect, on some of the things that could be changed in next week's budget. And the, and the, and the first question I was really asked was around stamp duty. Now, obviously, as most people know, if you buy a house, you have stamp duty to pay, uh, which is effectively a tax that has no purpose other than just to take money from you. Now, there are rules and bans for um, stamp duty. It's, it's been changed over the years. At the moment, for example, you don't pay any stamp duty on the first £125,000 of the price of your house. And there's bans going all the way up to 12%, which you have to pay. And I'm not going to read all the different bans out because people probably know them if they're interested in stamp duty. Now, the changes that happened recently is that if you had a second home... They added an extra 3% onto the standard rates that you uh, were charged. So they were penalising buy-to-let landlords. That was what they were really trying to do, and it worked. When you say it worked, Damien, mm. how, what, what, do you, what do you mean by that exactly? Well, if you, It worked for the government? Or? Well, it worked for them, I suppose, in both ways. What it did is, if you had a house and you were going to try and buy another house, then the stamp duty you would pay, let's say you had a, a house that was worth just under 250,000 you were buying and normally what happened you'd have paid 2% on the portion that was above 125,000 pounds yeah if it if it was your second home then they added an extra 3% so that made that charge 5% on that portion of the house price so it was like an extra kicker the idea was to try and deter landlords because i think the landlord um, buy to let market kind of got away with um run away with itself and People will find it hard to get on the housing market and obviously the government wants our housing market to be fluid and they want young people to get on the housing market because there's a bit of a housing crisis and to free up property they wanted to deter, deter landlords really to sort of basically it'd been sweetened so much um, the deal that they had on various tax reliefs that that's why people piled into buy to let property so they started to try and unwind that so that's it worked. There was a big drop off in the number of buy to let landlords who were going out there trying to buy new properties and getting into it. And when I was talking to mortgage brokers out there, it was all going towards first time buyers. There was hardly any first time buyers. It was all people being greedy and buying second properties. That has shifted. So, is it definitely that it did tail off, or that these kind of mortgages are, are going underground and, and landlords are finding cheekier ways to get around it? I'm sure. So that's not the case. Well, no. Well, well no. Do you know what? There was. I, let me just jump forward onto another part. Actually, I'm going to talk about this in in the round. But they also got tax. They used to be able to offset their interest on their mortgages against their profits as landlords, and that is has been uh, reduced. So they can't do that now. So it's slowly it's been changing, and that change was uh, had a huge impact as well on landlords. It made being a landlord less profitable. And really, if you want to be a buy to let landlord, you need to be able to buy the property mostly with cash rather than with debt, i.e., a mortgage. And um, that worked well, but the landlords have been getting around this by forming companies, so setting themselves up as companies, and it's a, a loophole. So you kind of preempted one of the points here, actually, that they reckon in this budget that they're going to close that loophole and try and stop yeah. landlords. So that's the first thing. On the stamp duty front, they don't think there'll be any major changes to stamp duty, although... One of the um, possible things they may do is have a stamp duty holiday for first-time buyers. So if you buy a house, you won't necessarily pay stamp duty for a particular period of time. And so that should save a first-time buyer in London. And so that obviously the prices are higher, so the stamp duty would be higher. Around £11,000 on a house purchase, which is a lot of money. So that's trying to, again, help first-time buyers get onto the market. We'll have to see if that happens, but it's probably the... Of all the things they've suggested out there, which a couple of others I'll come on to, it's the mo one of the most likely um, to happen. So in terms of stamp duty, there's a very good chance that there'll be a little sweetener for first-time buyers, but probably not a not much else. Um, there were people who suggested that they might try and change the whole regime and make it that uh, people who sell their houses pay the stamp duty rather than the people who buy the houses. But that wouldn't really work because that would just push house prices up because 
if I was selling my house and I had to pay stamp duty for the person buying you it. You just put the stamp duty price on yeah, top. So yeah, so it kind of is counterintuitive, so I don't believe that. Um, on personal allowances, they're not expecting much to happen, actually, because we've already committed to um, increasing the personal allowance for income tax up to 12500 by 2020, it's already at 11,500, so there's not going to be anything crazy going on. Um, national insurance, they don't think there'll be too many changes on that because obviously Philip Hammond last time changed, he tried to change uh, national insurance contributions and the way it was set up, and uh, he got absolutely uh, almost lynched for it. And they had to do a big U turn in the, in the last budget, so um, it's unlikely they think anything to happen on that. On pensions, they don't think the allowances, the amount you can put in, will necessarily change. So you can put in, well, typically £40,000 a year, um, but also it's impacted by how much you earn uh, into a pension. There are nuances to those rules, but they don't think that will necessarily change because they're a bit too complicated as it is. But people talk about whether they're going to reduce the tax relief people receive, and so you don't get as much incentive for putting money into a pension. Um, we'll see. They they say that every time. I I can't. I've lost count the number of times I've um, heard that they're going to attack the relief, and it never happens. So it'll be interesting if it does. But I think the they normally change the allowances, the amount you can put in. Um, because don't forget, if it's a Tory government, then they don't like to tax rich people too much. Um, the other thing that they might might change is. Um, some of the reliefs on things like VCTs, if you don't know what they are, venture capitalist trusts, they are a type of investment that were, if you were a, a, a small company, so they, what they could do is that you could wrap yourself up into like a this structure that allowed people to, if they invested in you, they got a 30% effective tax relief. So it was good because it incentivized people who had money to invest in some of these small startups who, who qualified under this certain structure. They might reduce that because all that was happening is rich people were using it as a means to cut their tax bill. Um, yeah. it, similarly, there's um, currently there's something called AIM shares. Now, AIM shares are very small shares. They don't, they don't trade on like, the, they're not in the FTSE 100 or the FTSE 250. They're much smaller than that. And those types of shares qualify for a very, very, very good inheritance tax perk if you hold those for two years then they don't you don't have to pay inheritance tax relief on uh, inheritance tax on them sorry damien aim as in a i m yeah aim yeah but it's, a, it's an acronym it stands for alternative investment market so it's right kind of a it's a, a small subset of the of the london stock market and those shares attracted a particular inheritance tax uh, advantage. So if you held them for two years, you didn't have to pay inheritance tax on them. There were some caveats, but the idea is that, again, for small companies to be able to pass on shares. But what happened is that I know this because I used to work in the city. People used to sometimes um, advise clients, you know what, pile into a load of AIM shares. They're really, they're, obviously, they're very, very volatile. So you can end up losing a lot of value on them, but they go up and down. And actually, you can make some good money. But if they used to put money in them because after two years, they would therefore qualify for and not have to pay inheritance tax so yeah that isn't the the spirit of what's meant to happen so that might be attacked there was a dividend tax allowance if you have dividends at all or you're self-employed you'll know all about what the dividend tax allowance is um effectively there was a five grand allowance everybody had which was the income they could receive separate to their personal allowance for income tax the dividend income they could receive without being charged tax on it because it got the whole tax regime got changed a few years back with um, dividends, but they were going to cut that to two grand. And when we had a snap election, they ditched that idea. So that might come back. It's still five grand at the moment, but it might go down to two. So yeah, that I think that's about it on all of the things that I've I've heard that might happen. I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball. We'll probably find it won't be actually that exciting going forward because I think the government's got bigger things on its mind to do with Brexit, etc. So, and they probably don't want any more embarrassing new turns. So I don't think it's going to be anything crazy. Maybe stamp duty might have something for first time buyers, but we will see. And of course, if it's anything of interest, we'll, we'll cover it on the, the podcast briefly next week. Before we move on, Andy, I just wanted to quickly mention 8020 Investor. Now, 8020 Investor is my DIY investment service. Do go and check it out. I empower and teach people how to invest their own money. The service provides data-driven fund tables. The data is driven by my own unique 8020 Investor algorithm, which I created. You also get stop-loss alerts. You get research articles and insights. You get market commentaries, monthly commentaries 
and DIY investment lessons, but you also get access to my £50,000 portfolio, which is a portfolio of my own money, which I run live on the site for members to see. And it shows people how I use the service to uh, maximise my returns. And in the first two years of doing so, I turned £50,000 into £59,500, which is a a 19% return, beating investment managers, professional fund managers, financial advisors, investment banks, passive trackers, and the market. So everybody can have a free 30-day trial of 8020 investor and you can claim that by going to moneytothemasses.com and going and clicking on the 8020 investor hyperlink at the top of the page so go and try the service let me know what you think of it and I, I know from the feedback that you're going to love it but for now on with the show Following on from hearing your voice on that, or your dulcet tones on that lovely advert there, Damien, investing. Let's do the investing piece. We were talking about um, diversifying portfolios. Now, we've done bits and pieces on this before, and I find this particularly interesting. So, shoot, what have we got this week? Well, what this came from something I was doing for 8020 Investor uh, subscribers, because now every week I send out a, a piece of insight, a newsletter. I mean, this is separate to the articles I also do and the data, etc. I Every week we'll do a piece that goes out at 9.30 on a Saturday. will be some form of analysis or commentary about what's been going on in markets. And sometimes it's a bit of a DIY lesson in there as well. And this week's one I thought was particularly interesting. I mean, I would say that. I wrote it. But it was <laughs> it, it, what I wanted to do. I'm not obviously going to tell people what it was about or because that's for 8020 investor members. But one of the points that came out of it that I just wanted to pull out and use in the podcast that was almost a passing point for the, for the 8020 investor members was to do with diversification of assets. Now, one of the things when you have a portfolio is that if you only put all your eggs in one basket, whether it's property, whether it's shares, then, of course, your the fortunes of your portfolio are based so, solely upon the outcome of that asset. It's even worse if you just invest all your money in a one company's shares that gets even worse your their fortunes all based on that particular company now obviously one way to get around that investment risk is to hold different types of assets because the theory which does tend to bear out is that different types of assets can perform differently in different markets now one of the things i just wanted to broadly talk about is the relationship between equities and bonds now the idea is that if you hold a portfolio equities are shares and they go up and down and they're very volatile but the very simplistic method of diversifying is to hold bonds now a bond is in effect a loan to a company it's just but they're tradable so it's a a very sort of what you end up doing is is if you think it was a company that you physically gave a loan to of a hundred grand let's just use round numbers and you got paid 5% 5% a year, so it would be about 5 grand, and you got your money back after 10. That's a loan, but if you then were able to trade that to somebody else, you sold it on because you didn't want to be given a loan to that person anymore, they will buy off you at a reduced rate. That's a bond. And of course, bond funds and things, they have loads and loads of these all wrapped up into a fund. And all the companies out there that you will know will issue um, this kind of debt because it enables them to grow. And so bonds, therefore, have a they're really a cash flow uh, investment. So they are much lower risk. The real risk is that people will default. But if, as long as you hold on to them until they end, the worst case scenario is you get your money back and the money you've had. So that's why they're low risk. Now, the point is that the simplistic way to diversify is to hold more bonds the less risk you want to take. So if you're uh, of a certain age, you might decide that you want to hold 80% of your portfolio in equities. But you might decide, oh, do you know what, markets are high, I'm getting older, I don't want to run the risk of the markets crashing in, in half and I lose all my money. So you might start investing more in bonds and less in equities. And that tends to hold true. But one of the things I wanted to highlight to people is that since the financial crisis, the the, the correlation between assets, now correlation is the relationship. If one moves up, then the other moves up or in the opposite direction. Those correlations are slightly broken down. What used to happen is that bonds and equities weren't particularly correlated. There was quite a low correlation. When the financial crisis hit, nearly everything was correlated. So basically, it didn't matter what you bought, whether it was a bond, whether it was an equity or any other type of asset, the financial system, the banking system was about to implode. So whatever you did, pretty much the only way you could make any money or not lose money was to keep it in cash. And so everything became correlated. 
But what was interesting, I don't think most people realise, is that the correlations since that financial crisis then started to slowly revert back towards more what they had been before. But they've never fully gone back to how they were. So let's say before the financial crisis, bonds were not really correlated to equities over like that 10 years. Hardly, very, very low correlation. So when equities moved up, then bonds didn't necessarily move up. Equally, when markets crashed and equities, bonds didn't crash. There was a low correlation. Now, that correlation, even after the financial crisis and things have settled down, there is a higher correlation than there used to be. So if equity markets go up, bond markets do go up proportionally, more than they used to. And if equity markets crash, then bond markets, rather than just sort of do the opposite or sit still, they tend to nudge down a bit and part of that reason why is because when you think about it when I talk about quantitative easing all that money printing and the water in the garden analogy in order to print money central banks didn't physically print money they what they did is they created fictional money on a computer so out of thin air and they used that money and went and bought things off of banks so they went and bought bonds and things like that off of banks and gave them money which they were then meant to go and lend into the economy and boost the economy what it meant is that they were one of the biggest the central banks became one of the biggest buyers in the bond market so they are artificially and they still have they have I mean they have trillions of this stuff around the world they've artificially influenced the price of bonds so the, but all the bonds rallied and of course all that money that the banks have received just found its way into equity markets so that's why you can see they kind of that correlation is started to become more positive so when equity markets move up and down there bonds don't necessarily follow in lockstep but there is a bit more of a correlation than there used to be so i just wanted to throw that out there to people to realize that we are in a different world and the world hasn't reverted back to the, the sort of stereotypical ideas we had before and a lot of the asset alloc allocation models you read about from the past from investing books will talk very much about bonds and equities now as a final point on the on this piece bonds themselves are, there's very diff there's lots of different types of bond there now i use the word bond to cover things like guilt now a guilt is a loan to the UK government. It's a bond rather than a company issue in it like Tesco's, the government does. So the government does has loads of these. So they borrow money um, like a loan from other countries or you can borrow from institutions or even people. You can as an individual buy a guilt. And it's effectively a loan that the government guarantees to pay back. Of course, because the government is very unlikely to default on that bond, it, we're not. it's not Venezuela or anything, it's the UK government, we should hopefully um, not default then the amount of interest you get is barely really low and they're almost so secure that it's pretty much like holding your money in cash because they're not going to sort of sell off people aren't going to panic and flog them and therefore the price fall then you've got the next step up which are the really big companies out there and they're called investment grade and they're like they're corporate bonds to corporations now there's a final um, type which is called high yield and even further down the line there's things called junk bonds so high yield bonds and they're bonds that pay you high yields are you get high interest and the reason you get higher interest is because the credit rating this like worthiness of these companies is lower so it'd be a company that you have no um, guarantee that will necessarily be there um, in a year's time or something like that so if you were going to lend money to let's just say Lloyd's TSB or Lloyd's TSB doesn't exist but Lloyd's then you pretty much certain they'll hopefully be around to repay that in the future but if it was a much smaller i don't know um house builder or something like that you might not be certain they won't go bust at some point so therefore you get paid higher rates now people will see these if you invest you'll see high yield bond funds and they're quite attractive and they can have some really good returns because you get good interest my real final point on this which i'm getting to is that these types of bonds have a very high correlation to equities so they actually much higher correlation actually a very very positive correlation so we're talking about when equity markets go up these high yield bonds tend to go up as well and when the markets crash these high yield bonds tend to crash so what would happen is if you just simplistically went i want a bond i'm going to go into fixed interest bonds to diversify my portfolio if you didn't go into the kind of guilt or corporate bond end then if you go into the stuff that looks quite exciting it's high yield and it's doing well when markets equity markets are flying there's a danger you might be buying high yield bonds which in itself isn't a problem 
I mean, don't get me wrong, there's some great funds and I invested in them as well. But I think it's just to point out to people so they understand that there is a correlation within that asset class. There are, there are certain ones. Anything in the sterling high yield bond sector out there will have a high correlation to equity. So it's just a bit of a flag for people to bear in mind and something that I know for a fact a lot of financial advisors out there wouldn't even um, probably tell their clients. They'll just go, oh, it's got a good yield or something like that. And it's a, or it's a very well-known fund. But actually, you have to re realise the, the risks there. So the final thing, which this is where 80 20 investors had something really interesting. There's been that, that link between high yield bonds and equity markets is really interesting in itself. And that correlation, how it changes over time, because it can tell you a lot about what might happen in stock markets but that's if you want to find out more on that then go and read um, 8020 investor and get a free trial but uh, there we go andy a quick bit on diversification and teaching people about bonds beautiful black friday is it a swindle yeah <laughs> Do you, know, do you know what, Andy? So you heard me turn the page there because I, I do write notes on this stuff. <laughs> I can't remember it all. Um, Black Friday, I think it's the biggest con going. I, I loathe it because in previous years, I've seen research to suggest, even though this is not meant to happen, that they actually alter prices to make things look better. There are very limited offers on some of these deals to do with TVs. And I just think it anything that encourages people to be greedy and descend to the lowest common denominator in terms of behaviour is something that we just don't want to encourage. And the reason it exists in America is because in America, is it Thanksgiving they've got coming up, Andy? And is, yeah. yeah, and and in the UK, it's very different. After things like Halloween and uh, Guy Fawkes Night and things like that, we, we start to look towards Christmas. But in America, because of Thanksgiving, they don't. They don't think about Christmas until that's passed. And so what black friday was in america and then and, and the it's sort of cousin cyber monday which was to encourage people to get them into that yeah let's shop for christmas so they just give loads and loads of discounts to get people literally stampeding through the front doors of shops so we didn't really need it over here but they've brought it over because in a world that is increasingly uh, linked up and uh, we have things like amazon globally that stretch these multinational companies they've realised it's a good way of getting people online and stampeding for um, deals. So, yes, you will get some people have amazing bargains. The one thing I hear a lot of if people talk about how to get the best out of it is you have to just do a load and load and load of research beforehand on the things that you want and to see the prices, um, then check the prices on things like Amel, uh, Amazon. Um, the reason I said Amel there, because I was thinking of camel, camel, camel uk, which is a site that gives you price alerts on Amazon. So if you ever want to do that, so you can see when the price of something drops, and you can see it um, in comparison to its, I think it's the last 60 to 90 days. So you can see whether the price of something has gone, how it's gone up and down over time and judge whether you're getting a good deal. So have a look at that because that is a very clever um, website, which will therefore tell you whether this deal is really as good as it looks because I never believe all that uh, recommended retail price nonsense. But anyway, my talk on Black Friday was not about what to buy and not to buy. It was just to give people a, um, some tips about staying safe on Black Friday. Now, Black Friday has got a huge demand for consumers, but it means it's got a huge, huge opportunity for fraudsters. And so they go out there knowing that people are in a greed kind of mindset. So they're going to go clicking, buying, doing anything to get a bargain. They're in this bargain mindset. And so a few things to look out for. Look out for dodgy URLs on anything you um, go and like websites you go on. Look out for phishing emails. You know that's phishing with a PH, which are these emails you get that appear to be from genuine institutions, maybe Amazon or anything, telling you about orders or something, and you tell you to click on the link to go and check something. They are normally some form of scam that will happen is that you will click on the link and it will take you through to a fake version of the site and then therefore they'll take details from you or some financial information which they can then use to steal money from you or impersonate you in some way. So um, there's a lot of that going on, especially things with deals as well. So another one is courier email. So you know when you get something from, I don't know, name one of the, I don't know, parcel force or whatever it is, saying that you've got a parcel that's been waited or waiting to be uh, delivered or you missed it. Yeah. They'll send you something like that. So the message is on all these things, if you get an email, log into the site separately via your own like google google it 
go to the site and find out information that way and log into your area because if it's not something you recognize that's being delivered and it's probably a fake but also if it's something that looks like it's coming from Amazon log into Amazon don't go via their link to see if it's true or not and then delete it it's one of those things you get very because you've got so much stuff coming if you're going to order loads of things on Black Friday it's very easy to um, fall foul of this I mean do you use Black Friday Andy would you even get involved yeah I have used it and um, I, you know I heed your advice really I, I don't want to get too sucked into it I do know it's a bit of a thing is once you see you end up clicking and clicking and clicking you end up buying stuff that actually you're not even wanting to buy in the first place so i try and steer clear of it if i can i know i'm sounding like an old man uh, but i do do most of my christmas shopping on amazon so i'm i'm kind of already in that mind space so i i, I do get dragged in i mean I, i'm i'm all for people saving money and i love to hear about people who saved a fortune which is which is fantastic but i'm just one that more of a, one of those people who always focuses on how much you spend rather than the saving element because it's easy to convince you you saved a load of money on and then you realize you didn't want it but the the one thing i do want to pull out is i had an email from all people is um, a guy who who actually does our hosting who got in touch who listens to the podcast and why not hey I mean the guy who does a lot of the sort of I didn't even know didn't even know his name until he emailed me um, but he got in touch to say about PayPal and how you pay for things and a very quick point on PayPal now if I was going to pay for something online then PayPal is wonderful if you're going to use a site you don't particularly know because you can mask your um, hide your credit card details so rather than a site you'd think oh this is a great deal you plow in with your credit card and then you find out it's something dodgy and they've ripped your credit card details and off they go obviously you do it via paypal you can they can't see your credit de card details so that's a real positive but there is something that's slightly um, unfortunate about that if you use your credit card and you buy something with a value of between a hundred pound and thirty thousand you get that section uh, 75 protection under the consumer credit act which means that but if you buy something and the company doesn't deliver it it goes bust or something like that you can go to the credit card company and make a claim against them because they're jointly and severally liable is the term so it means that you've got loads of protection but if um before I, but quick one on that if if something is worth over a hundred pound and you only put one pound on your credit card you still get the cover you don't have to put the full amount of the item um so you can avoid the admin fees in that way but if you use paypal to hide your credit card details it severs the link between you and the person that you that you bought through so the current understanding of the rules is you wouldn't get that protection under the consumer credit act it's lost because you actually bought via PayPal. And so that's a bit of an issue. So people have to decide what they value most. I mean, are you more worried that the site is genuine and whether they're going to probably either steal your credit card details or somehow get hacked and leak them? Or are you more concerned about the fact they're going to actually fulfill your order? And um, I mean, I would always try and... Uh, I, I always tend to uh, use PayPal anyway for that for those reasons. I'm more worried about people, what they do with my credit card details. But... If you're worried about the fulfillment of an order, then yeah, of course you'd want to use your full credit card on that. So just to um, sort of butt in a bit there, um, although PayPal obviously yeah, that severs the link and you don't have that full assurance and guarantee as per the um, is it the Consumer Credit Act seventy five? Yes, it, that, that's that's it, Andy. There we go. I do try and learn, but PayPal have their own sort of rules, albeit they won't probably cover you up to the same sort of amounts. But their their customer service is brilliant. I had a dodgy payment go through, and I got straight in contact with PayPal, and within two hours the money was back in my account, and they agreed that the the it was a dodgy per you know it was a dodgy site. So. Yeah, and that is, I mean, to hear from straight from the horse's mouth of how good PayPal, PayPal can be because what you're referring to there is they have their own scheme and of course that isn't something that's legally binding anyway it's almost like a code of conduct which they yeah. apply and so in your instance they'll probably be wonderful but I think people just have to realise that they there are people now becoming sort of financially astute enough to realise I, I want to pay my credit card for this because I get protection but they don't if they're under PayPal they've only got PayPal's protection which isn't just as you pointed out, Andy, is nowhere near as good as what the consumer, um, the protection under the Consumer Credit Act. But that's not to say it's useless at all. It's just not the same thing. So if you're prepared for that, which I think most people would be and accept it, then yeah, go for it and just understand that there is a difference. So I am, I am still happy to use PayPal. I use PayPal a lot because I'm more worried about people stealing my credit card details. And I don't tend to make purchases online of lavish levels that 
I would worry that um, I wasn't going to have a thirty-five, thirty thousand pound item turn up at yeah. my at my terraced house. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you where, where PayPal really is is absolutely streets ahead and where it's brilliant is for small businesses you know little startups and bits that we talk about on the one giant leap podcast it gives people the opportunity to, without cash having to actually physically change hands and via the internet and social media and everything be, you know be able to start up small businesses and, and have that transfer of funds going backwards and forwards i think it's brilliant you know it's you imagine 10 years ago there wasn't really that kind of access i know paypal's been around for longer than that but paypal really has come into its own for that reason yeah and you know what i i i, I am second that because we use paypal for 80 20 investor and some people have said to us, why can't I just give you my credit card details? I haven't got a PayPal account. But, of course, you don't have to put money in a PayPal account. You can just use it as a means to, you register it as a means to just process a payment, like using the till, do you know what I mean? It's like that. And I think a lot of people don't realise that. But the reason also I like using that as a, as a person who offers a, a service, where is a subscription model that... I don't want people's credit card details mm. because then there's an onus on me to have to have a level of protection around these things, which people need to be responsible for. So if you're giving your credit card details to people, there's a huge amount of, of um, legal obligation that they need to do to ensure that they don't get lost and hacked. So PayPal is wonderful, although they charge, obviously, companies to use their service, but that can also limit the, the obligations on that, that part because you therefore don't have their credit card details, which therefore means that it's protection for the consumer. So we've had that funny conversation. It's good if you use PayPal for that reason, that if you come across a service, because it actually protects you. So anyway, we seem to be advertising PayPal, but um, we went, yeah, we went from Amazon straight through onto PayPal. And we spent more time talking about PayPal than we did, uh, sorry, Amazon Black Friday, really. Right, so uh, Damien, other than... Uh, PayPal, our new sponsors. Is there is there anything else we need to cover this <laughs> no, week? No, that's it this week, Andy. Um, if nothing else, obviously, like I said earlier on, there's going to be the budget is going to be one of the things we'll talk about in the upcoming podcast anyway. If there's anything of interest, I don't, I'm not sure there will be, but um, we'll cover that. So uh, look out for that because, yeah, we'll be on it. Good. Well, we've covered the please review us bit at the start of the podcast. So I suppose all that's left to say is if you do want to get in touch with Damien, please do so. He loves getting your questions. It's at money to the masses with a number two. Or you can also get in contact, as always, at podcast at money to the masses dot com. And I would say on that, Andy, that Twitter is a really good one because it people will then ask succinct questions and I can answer it very quickly. The problem is obviously that with emails I can get a lot of emails and trying to get through them all is, is more difficult. So do try Twitter first. Um, yeah anyway, till next week Andy. Until next week. Don't forget to claim your free copy of Damien's best-selling book, The 30-Day Money Plan. Sort your finances in just five minutes a day, worth $4.99. Just go to moneytothemasses.com slash podcast to find out how.